at the very beginning, someone had said to me, you know, we'd like to appoint you executive director, say in 1978, and we want you to build an organization in three or four years that will have 1,500 people. We want to have a multi-million dollar budget. We want all these different tournaments. I would have said, you know, look for someone else. I mean, that's crazy. There's not a lot of written record about that that I have or anyone else has about those early years. I think it's fair to say that the primary function that had importance was that the ITCA, when, when it was founded, they began naming the All-American team. There was a president, treasurer, secretary, and I guess vice president. But it was really just a name only. The, the working budget of the ITA was roughly about three dollars $400 a year. The ITCA would meet during the NCAA championship, which again until 77 was, was a singles and doubles event, not a team event. And uh, they would um, have a meeting and sort of talk, uh, have some beer, talk war, war, war stories and make the decision of who was on the All-American team. George Tolley is, stands up and says, I'm very upset. You know, we put up last year with, with, with these conditions. We voted unanimously not to return. And here we are again. It's totally unacceptable and, and uh, we have to do something about this. So Jerry Miles sort of stood up and very timidly and hesitantly said, well, I, I, I don't know if that's really, you know, fair and proper to, you know, and it's really an NCAA decision. And George Tolley just stared at him and said, this is an ITCA meeting. You're not invited to this meeting. We would appreciate you leaving the meeting. Now, you, you can't imagine that, that happening now. But um, end of the story, it didn't return the next year to Corpus Christi. It actually went to Georgia. It was just very good timing because tennis was becoming very popular thanks to Borg and Connors. And sponsors were looking at ways to do more with, with tennis, including college tennis. And um, I, again, uh, was on the NCAA committee. Then I was um, appointed chairman of the NCAA Tennis Committee. Got very involved and, and, and then was elected president in, I think, 78 or so. So I was chairman of the NCAA committee and um, president of the ITCA. And that was very fortuitous because obviously it gave me a chance to kind of link the two as you know, in, 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 as much as possible. So I think all, all of those things, and it happened pretty quickly. I mean, from seven, 1975, where there, the operating budget was three, $400 a year, and there were 50 coaches, to um, and no board of directors, no committees, nothing, to um, say 1980, where we had formed a board of directors, we had created certain key committees, like a rules committee, like an operating committee. When we did create a board of directors, it was ex exclusively coaches. Um, we worked with many different companies and groups, and I did, and got a lot of good advice and a lot of help from them. But in terms of understanding college tennis, what was the most important for college tennis, I think, as, I think the coaches understood that better and were more motivated. It became very clear there were a lot of opportunities and um, there were a lot of very bright coaches. Um, and a lot of the coaches had different types of experiences. Uh, almost many of them were running camps and those were big, you know, often big money makers and, and took a lot of different skills and others had other types of experiences. So uh, there was a, a real wealth of, of, uh, of talent among the coaches. And um, sort of an open playing field, sort of a vacuum. So it kind of was fun. How do you fill that vacuum? 
in, in the 70s, and the 70s really was the boon of college, of, of tennis. You know, that was the famous Battle of the Sexes match. Again, Connors became a star and played these challenge matches, like almost like a big boxing match against uh, Laver. Um, so there was a lot of excitement. There was, there was a lot of TV coverage. Sponsors were getting really interested in, in, in tennis. So there was the opportunity to take advantage of that and and do more with college tennis. And at the same time, a sense of frustration maybe most exemplified by what happened at Corpus Christi, that we were the forgotten stepchildren of the NCAA. And that was very frustrating. I and mean, here we have these wonderful players, a great sport, something we all loved, we're very proud of, but no one knew about it other than the parents and the kids. I think the tournaments were the starting point. It, it gave you a, a sense that that the, IT, the ITCA had a certain identity. It was, it, it, you know, the tournaments are always the biggest thing in any college players, tennis players world. So it, it one, created some awareness among the sponsors. Two, um, it, it created opportunities for the players and their parents and sort of put the ITC on their map because, it, it, you know, and, and then it, a lot, one thing led to the other to the other. The way things were, there was no real organized competition until the winter, you know, the middle of the winter. So there's this huge vacuum and that wasn't good. I mean, you know, if, if, if you want to improve as a player, you improve through coaching, through practice and through competition. Well, there was no, there wasn't much competition. And so this provided now a structure where the coaches would, ha would have opportunities for their players to get, to improve, to get on the map. There could be goals that could be set, not just what, one tournament in June originally, where if you happen to have, you know, sick for a day, that's it for the whole year. Now there was uh, a whole series of pretty well thought out programs um, that gave a lot of opportunities to literally thousands of people in an, in an organized way. Before I became president, um, and then when I was elected president, um, Dave Snyder, who at the time was the president, said, you know, we can you find some money so we can make the team event in Wisconsin, you know, make it a national event. So being in Princeton, I uh, was lucky that the, the Prince Racket Company, man, which had just become a significant company, um, it didn't even exist until 73 or four. Um, and I talked to the, um, the president of Prince and said, you know, would you have any interest in giving us a little money? And we were talking like $10,000 for, for an event in Wisconsin. And um, they said, well, let us think about it. And we, we had sort of run out of time. So we decided to do the event in Wisconsin with no budget at all, just have everyone come at their expense. And then Prince came back to me and said, we um, can give you $10,000. Uh, we'd like to do something. So I said, well, let me think about it. And this was 19, um, the, the fall of 1977. And um, I, I, had, I was aware of the fact that there was a, gonna be a nice small tournament with 16 players in Houston, Texas, hosted by Sammy Jumava, whose son was a freshman at Trinity, Tony Jumava. And I, I knew through the grapevine, uh, our, our players weren't going to be playing in it, but there was just 16 men's players, and one of whom was the returning NCAA champion, Matt Mitchell, from Stanford. And Matt had won the championship in 77. So he, he was planning in February to have a, a nice tournament with his son playing in it with um, Matt Mitchell. And, and it's like November, so I sort of had a little light bulb go off in my head, and I called up Sammy, who you know, I knew very casually, and said, would you be interested in taking your making your tournament, which is a draw of 16, into a larger draw of 32 and calling it a national indoor championship run by the ITCA? Uh, he said, sure. So we had our, our first national ITCA championship with $10,000, went really, really well. And that, that was kind of the start, but it's a good example of how things grew because um, it, went, it went so well, the next year we said, well, that's an indoor championship, but maybe could do another national event. 
And at that point, Nike was just getting into the picture. That's how incrementally, so the All-American Tournament um, became successful. And then, um, again, just informal group of coaches, we didn't have a board yet or committees, said, you know, it would be really neat if we could expand this national indoor event and, and have some regional events. Because not, obviously, only 32 people are playing it. But there are very few events particularly in the fall for college tennis, and, and it would be exciting and give more people a chance to be invested in in what we're doing and have a chance to, to get to, to Houston. So we started to set up some regional events, and originally it was just men, and, eight, and there were eight regions, and each region um, uh, invited all the schools. What we decided was, um, and we were just beginning to figure we should have membership dues and have members, that if you were a member of the ITA and the dues were like $20 a year or something, um, your player, your best player had the right to play in this tournament. I mentioned the tournaments give a player a chance and as coach and a school to get recognition. Well, the rankings do enormously. And that, that was tremendous fun. Um, how do you create a rankings? And, you know, because we couldn't use the formula that the pros use because we had team competition. So how do you, both for teams, but individual, how do you do this? So that was a fond memory. I, I still remember me and Alan Fox and Alan was a world-class player who has a PhD in psychology taught um, at, um, at Pepperdine. He was the coach at Pepperdine for a while. And very, a great sense of humor. He's written like eight books and uh, lots of ideas. And we just sat down one day and said, like, well, if we sort of reverse engineered it and said, <clears throat> if we're gonna do some sort of ranking system, and it was sort of the end of the spring, and we say, okay, we know who we feel are the best 25 players, let's say. We're, we're sure of it. Um, so if, if we want to create a system, we want the system to end up saying that these are the best 25 players. So how do you do that? And we started playing around with that. And that was, I remember that was a lot of fun, you know, sort of inventing something. There were no rules governing the play of college tennis. And to my uh, surprise is understatement, when I was chairman of the NCAA Tennis Committee, I said, well, there are a couple of problems on code, we should make some rules. And the NCAA powers that they said, the NCAA Tennis Committee is not a rules committee. You do not have the right to make rules. The NCAA cannot, um, by its bylaws, make rules for college tennis. In basketball, yes, there's a basketball rules committee and they make all the rules for basketball. So, okay, it's the vacuum. We need some rules. You know, the USTA had no rules for college tennis. The USTA had no relationship with college tennis. So, you know, if, if it's really cold outside and you have indoor courts, um, can, the, can the home coach say, we're gonna play outside or inside? Well, often the home coach would do whatever to his or her advantage. And we didn't, that wasn't right. So the rules became pretty important. By 1980, we, had, we didn't have um, a constitution. We put together a constitution. We, we became 501c3. Um, and then we had, over a year, a discussion about should we, as the ITCA, which was men's coaches, um, would it be best to have women um, and do, do everything together or not? And we decided, um, yes, it would be. So that was roughly 80 or 81. We eventually created a small college championship. I think maybe they've changed the name of it now. Um, so the winners of, 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 of that event would have an automatic place in the Division I national championship. So there was a, 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 an opportunity to progress. And basically what we were able to say is we, you know, we're, we have a, a fairly unique event that has as many as 10,000 people playing in it. So, Anyone who's playing college tennis at any division can play in in our national intercollegiate event. If they win their regional event, let's say it's division two or three, they go to the national 
small college event. If they win that event, then they go to the Division One event. So in theory, any one of those 10,000 players, by being a college player, by being a part of the ITA, has the opportunity to, to win not only at their divisional level, but also win the national championship. It was and remains really important that um, it be um, seen as an organization that's, that's really um, reaching out all inclusively um, to, to all the different divisions, to the men and women. And looking back, I think, um, I think we accomplished a lot and we sort of did it ourselves, we the coaches and the players. And um, I think it's really made a difference and that those are all good things. But to be able to um, help build um, a structure and a program and a, and a, and a world that um, so many people really uh, appreciate, not that they necessarily appreciate that, that I've done it, you know, and, and, um, but rather to know that this did mean a lot to a lot of people.